Good morning, and here we are again. This is the the third Sunday of our isolation, and uh, that we're quarantined in our public contamination, perhaps. But uh, nevertheless, we still get to read the word, and I I'm in convinced that soon this will come to pass, and and that we'll be able to assemble ourselves together again. But this morning we continue in Romans chapter eleven. And before we look at Romans chapter 11, how about we go to the Lord in prayer? Father, I pray, Lord, that your word will be a lamp unto our feet, that by it you might show us where we are and what we are and who we are, and God, that it would also, uh, an even greater, be a light unto our path, that your word might show us where it is that we should go and might shine the way before us in your truth, God, and show us what sort of person that you would have us to be in you and what it is that we should do in honor and glory of you with our lives. And so, Lord, our dependence is upon you this morning. I uh, don't pray, Lord, to be right or to support some particular theology or I don't even want to think about an argument this morning, Lord. I want to look into your word. And I want to receive something from you. And I want to share something with you, Lord. And I want you to speak to us, God, that our relationship with you might be intimate and alive and active and real. And so that there might be evidence towards the world around us, God, that you do save and you do change lives. And there is a reward in serving you in Christ. And we pray. Amen. And so looking at, I warn you, Romans chapter 11, and as I just mentioned a few minutes ago before we went live, that, uh, you know, most of my exposure to Romans chapter 11 and Romans chapter 9 and even some of chapter 10 has always been caught up in all of this theological argument, you know, and who is right and who, what perspective is right and what does this mean and you know, trying to dissect things, and but uh, I, I hope to stay away from that. I got my fill of that in seminary, and it is necessary to go in there and to, to know what you believe and why you believe it. But before starting Romans 11, I want to just consider what we start off with and what is in our mind and what we're looking for. Uh, I'll remember, I mean, I'll remind you that uh, Romans chapter 9 went back uh, to Paul's burden for his own kinsmen, his fellow Jews, and how he wanted them to know Christ. And Romans chapter 10 uh, talked about, um, you know, how they can come to know Christ and how they currently are pursuing righteousness by a law and by a religion and by a rigor they can follow ultimately by their flesh, thinking that through their own humanity, that they're going to fulfill this law of God and that by that they might be righteous. And he said, no, 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 it's near you and even in your mouths, that is the word of faith with which we preach, that if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. And, and you, that comes about by somebody coming to you with the gospel message, you know, and how shall they... Believe in him in whom they have not heard, and how shall they hear without a preacher, and how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it said in Romans chapter 10, and how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good tidings to the gospel message, and faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And that's how they can know. And we get down there, and he ends Romans chapter 10 with that testimony against Israel that Isaiah gave, that their word has gone out, you know, and that God said that he would make them jealous, you know, through the Gentiles. And he finished chapter 10 with that quote there that, you know, I. but as for Israel, he says, all day long I've stretched out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. And that's the picture that we're left with. And I really believe that's the, the picture that persi- persists today that there is a God all day long reaching forth his hands to a disobedient and an obstinate people. And, uh, you know, I, I have to preface this whole thing with this. Much today I am speaking in terms 
just like Paul was speaking in terms, very much so in Romans chapter 9, 10, and as he does in 11, in a general collective sense of the Jews. I mean, obviously there was Jews like John the Baptist that never missed a lick in regards to Christ. He was there, he's coming, he's coming, and he's like, oh, here he is, and there he goes, follow him, you know? And, and he, he had it right all the way through. The Christ event didn't change anything for him. Uh, but, you know, when the Lord says, all day long I've stretched forth my hands to a disobedient, obstinate people, obviously it's not exhaustive and collective in every single one. But he's giving a generality. And the Lord is allowed to speak in generalities. You know, the Scripture is allowed to speak in generalities. God never wrote His Word to try to prove Himself or defend Himself. It's not exhaustive. John said that if His Word was exhaustive, that there wouldn't be enough room to contain it all. That it would be excessive. It would be too much. And so, you know, remember that. Because we're going to go through a lot of this. And there's going to be phrases like, all, of it, all Israel shall be saved. You're like, oh, really? Every Jew? Is that what that means? No, it's, it's spoken in a general sense, in a generic sense, in a collective sense, and it happens a lot today. But Romans chapter 11, and what is it and what is it for? Well, I'm going to cheat, and I'm going to jump ahead to Romans chapter 12. If anybody ever told you to, you know, if you're going to a text to answer a question... You go and read what the question is first in order that you might recognize the answer as you're reading the text. You know, very similar to that, that we're going to jump ahead, read Romans chapter 12. And what is the beginning of Romans chapter 12? After 11, you know, it's, you know, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present yourselves a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And then he goes on. To urge them, and be ye not you know, conformed unto this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your minds, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable will of God. And in that sense, and so the beginning, we know that after this chunk of Scripture, that Paul immediately begins to urge them, I urge you, therefore, I beseech you there, you know, choose to serve God. Choose to serve the Lord. That's really what... Roman, uh, Romans chapter 12 is all about giving your life to serve the Lord, you know, making opportunity to serve the Lord. So with that in mind, let's go back to Romans 11. <clears throat> and he said in Romans 11, 1, I say then, remember 10, 21, all day long I reached forth my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. Verse 1, chapter 11, I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? May it never be, for I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. And so Paul addresses the question. So, hey, since he talked back in chapter 9 about not all of Israel is Israel, and what really matters is that you're a son of faith, like, you know, as in a son of Abraham in faith, and that makes you truly an Israelite, and I think he goes back to, dis to address the ethnic question here, not just the spiritual question, but ethnically. So we think about Israel spiritually, we think about them ethnically as this people, because God did call an ethnic group to represent him in a very particular way. That's, that's even politically unfriendly today. I guess God was not aware of equal opportunity. <laughs> I don't know. Did God know about equal opportunity? <laughs> Did uh, I, He would be in big trouble, you know? Because, you know, God was very racial, if you want to use that term. He was ethnically specific in choosing Israel. And not only is there a spiritual significance to Him, there's an ethnic, there's a physical significance to that people group. Why? You know, why? Why was it? Because back in the day, and maybe, you know, if you were really, you know, skilled in history and civilization and uh, a knowledgeable, what were determined a few minutes ago, anthropologist, right? Yeah. You, maybe you can go back and support this over a course of many centuries in, in time, but God gave them the reason why he chose them way back in the desert. After Egypt, after he said, I didn't choose you because you were super duper people. He said, I chose you because you were the least of all, that you were the most weak. 
you know, that you were the ones in order that he might be shown strong through them. We see that mentality of God, you know, persevere in other things. Paul put it in terms of the gospel and in terms of those who preach the gospel, that God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. I've run into a few people that don't believe that I'm, you know, a reasonable person to communicate the gospel. And I, I would say I have to agree with them, but we both disagree with God. You know, that's the trouble in that, that God has chosen foolish things and weak things, right, to do his work. God did choose Israel very specifically, and I think Paul is turning his attention to him like, okay, in regards to their last name, in regards to their bloodlines, you know, has he rejected his people? May it never be. He said, and, and I say this because of what he says, for I too am a descendant of Abraham of the tribe Benjamin. And he gives that pedigree qualification and not just in the sense, if he had stopped at Abraham, I would thought, well, maybe he's just talking about, you know, a son of Abraham and faith in terms of faith. But no, he said, you know, of the tribe of Benjamin, as he pointed out, I think it was in Philippians chapter 3 as well. Verse 2, he says, God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel. And verse 3 he says, Lord, have they killed thy pro I'm sorry, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and they have torn down thine altars and I alone am left and they are seeking my life. I thought it was really interesting. It was a little bit convicting for me in the way that Paul wrote down Elijah's prayer. You know that he wasn't necessarily uh pleading for Israel, but against them. Perhaps he'd reached a point in his life where he had stopped praying in regards to God, restore them, and God, fill them with your spirit, and God, cause them to walk in paths of righteousness, and, you know, and God, make yourself known among your people, and, you know, in cynicism and frustration, and he's gotten to a point to where, he went out into the desert, uh, you know, alone, without food or water. And obviously he's not in the right frame of mind. And he got out there, and also what was in his mind was, you know, in as much, God, nobody out here cares for you. God, they're all a bunch of heathens. God, they're a bunch of pagans. God, I'm the only one. And I say that just as an aside, because it's not very hard for a pastor like me to get cynical about the world around me. And if you ever endeavor to share Christ with somebody, after you share Christ with 50 people and none of them really care, you start to become a little frustrated. And you start to become a little tired and you get to the point to where you want to throw your hands up. and you know. But we always have to remember, I don't want the description of me to be, oh, that one day that Jeff was pleading against his fellow Arlingtonites, you know, or his fellow Texans, and that I sat down before God to complain about the, the culture in which I live in and to complain uh, against the people out there. But rather, I want my intercession and petition to be for them, right? And in regards to God's will for them and how he desires for them to be saved and how he can be mighty in them, but how Elijah, what he pleaded with God against Israel. And, you know, and then the Lord, and this was, what, this was his perspective, that they've killed their prophets, they've torn down their altars, and I alone and left. That's not very hard for us to, to, you know, to relate to in our post-Christian culture that we lived in today. And I think it's, I think by practicality it's post-Christian. We live in a post-Christian. Christian culture. I mean, any culture that can kill three, four thousand unborn babies today is definitely doesn't still have Christian convictions. You know, any culture where divorce ends over fifty percent, you know, in marriages, any culture where uh, you know fornication is just rampant and common, even among churches. I mean, it's just. It's not a Christian culture. And we can relate very much to them. And we can say, God, they've taken the Ten Commandments out of all of our courtrooms. 
God, they've legalized abortion. God, they've done this. God, they've done that. You know, and the, and we we get overwhelmed with everything that we can see in front of our eyes and hear with our ears, and and we're not mindful and we're not unbelieving that God is under control and has His agenda still going on. Remember, I believe that. Paul is writing all of this to lead to our encouragement. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, to present yourselves a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him. You know, serve the Lord. Use your life to, to serve God. And so he goes through these things. He points out Elijah's petition against Israel and what his perspective with was. And I've got all the sympathy in the world uh, for Elijah. I mean, I, I, you know, he's a greater man than I am. And, you know, and I understand we even see something the same in Moses and some of the same kind of experiences in John the Baptist and just that frustration of, of serving the Lord in that capacity in a very large capacity in which he, re, he called them to serve. But he said, uh, but what is the divine response to him? We heard the very earthly and carnal and worldly mentality that had crept into the prophet, right? It was what he could see and what he could perceive with his eyes and his flesh and all those things. But what was the divine response to him? Hey, I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. You know, and the whole time God says, listen, I've, I've got it covered. You know, I haven't lost control. I haven't, you know, things aren't out of whack. You know, just because you can't see, you can, we can't see everything that God can see. And we don't know everything that God knows. And that's why so often in service to Him, we just have to chill out and relax and trust and persevere. But, you know, honestly, it gets lonely. And it gets a little frustrating. It gets discouraging. But go back and remember things like this, that God perseveres, that God, you know, we're not in it alone. Now, Elijah truly felt very much alone. I don't really think there was anybody comparable to him that came along the side of him that was at the time that was encouraging him. You know, pastors, elders of churches often get in that feeling of feeling very alone at least we have the opportunity to coming together and say hey you believe the lord oh yeah you still believe i believe the lord you are you still sharing the god i'm still sharing the gospel message and we provoke one another into love and to good works is what hebrews says you know to to persevere in the work in which we've been been called to do god's advice to him was cheer up in the moment that you think you have nothing to rejoice about, that you, you think that nothing looks good, that everything looks bleak, the whole time, you know, he had no idea, hey, God said, hey, I've reserved 7,000. Whether, God, whether God meant that 7,000 literally or whether he meant it metaphorically because seven being his very complete number, like Jesus said, hey, no, not seven, but 70 times seven. You know, in that sense, we'd have to put yourself in the, the numerical mind of a Jew with that number seven to wonder. But God says, I've got it taken care of, that he's done all those things. In verse five, he says, in the same way, then, there's also come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice, even right now. Now, I believe that even right now, there's, there's of course, there's the church. If you want to consider the church a remnant, you know, I, I suppose you could consider the church a remnant. Uh, I believe that even among the Jewish people, ethnically speaking, that God has a remnant, that he has a little lump in there, right, of believers, of those who have believed on him. Now, as a, remember, as a collective group today, which we're going to talk in a lot of terms of, of general groups, the Jews know they have not received him as a nation. And they have not believed on him and honored him as a nation. But there is still today, even today, a remnant within, within Israel. And why is all this great? Why is this important? Why is this, you know, and really the arguments, the theological arguments that come into Romans chapter 11 and Romans chapter 9 really come down to a difference between things called like dispensationalism or sessionism. Is that what it's called? Covenant theology? Sessionism? Not sensationalism, but cessation. 
I can't remember the second, there's another name for it. But covenant theology, or even, you know, some covenant theology even progresses into something called replacement theology. Now, I don't think most covenant theologists would call themselves replacement theologians. But, you know, whatever, if you really, I don't, I, I've been to seminary and had to dive through all that stuff, and I don't even want to anymore today at all <laughs> you know i'm not interested in that stuff and no this is the way i see it and that's the way you see it listen i want to know what the lord wants to provide to us today in order that we might serve him better today and know him better today and i look at all this you know the one of the greatest encouragements to me in romans chapter 9 and romans chapter 11 i'm going to sneak over <clears throat> to first corinthians 10 if you want to turn there, you can. I'm just going to read a short little chunk. You probably, some of y'all know what I'm going to read. Uh, in regards to Israel, uh, the scripture says this in 1 Corinthians 10, verse uh, 5. In regards to Israel, this is who he's talking about. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not well pleased, for they were laid low in the wilderness. In other words, remember that first generation died in the wilderness. Uh, they were laid low in the wilderness. Verse 6, <clears throat> he said, Now these things happened as examples for us that we should not crave evil things as they also craved, and do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink, and they stood up to play. In other words, uh, que sera, sera. They, they sat down to drink, and they rose up to play, and they went on about their lives. You know, and I, I read that to go back and to point out to us, listen, Israel is an example for us. They're an example for us. And, you know, sometimes we look at Israel, I personally, in my own life, I look at Israel collectively, how God intervened in into their life and how he saved them and brought them out of bondage in Egypt. How, you know, he had a will for them, but some of them were unwilling you know, to trust him and to follow him into that will for their lives. I look to see how they they came into a, a intimate relationship. They're very close. And you think about in the times of Joshua. You know, that was one of the times when they were entering into the Canaan land under the leadership of Joshua, when they were, for the most part as a nation, the majority of them believing him and serving him and following him. And when someone like Achan arose, and like, oh, because Achan was Achan for trouble, if you remember. But uh, if you don't remember, you have to go back to Joshua and find out. But when somebody like Achan arose and rebelled, that it was dealt with, and they were a fairly pure lump at the time. And I fast forward, and I look at moments like in, in the Davidic kingdom, when David was king, and idolatry was not tolerated you know, and it was such a glorious time, and there was a general fear and reverence for God in the nation overall. And then I look how something like that is, in fact, very quickly, you know, one generation after David, how it all just deteriorated and went into a, a bunch of spiritual garbage to the point of the, the country being split, civil war happening between them. And from that point, from, from the time of Solomon, they have never recovered to anything that is remotely glorious to God. It's very sad to say. But I look at all that example through there. I look in, in there how they how he called Abraham out, how they went through hardships, how they were delivered from Egypt. And, and I see examples in Christian lives, how people who once walked very close to Christ and they followed him into a promised land and they knew what it was to be indwelt with the Spirit, how they can fall into a backsliding condition and a condition of, of unbelief, not to the point of losing their salvation, but to the point of not being Spirit-filled, of not serving the Lord. I know because I've proved it in my own life. I know very well it's possible to know the Lord, to know His truth, to know what it is to be led by the Spirit, and to know what it is to come up to another chapter of life and, and ultimately get there and say, no, God, I can't believe you for that. And you think you're going to maintain, you, th you suppose things, but no, rather you deteriorate and you go downhill. And you find that things that once you had victory over, you don't have victory over anymore. 
And I, I'm pointing all this out to point out that what is Paul writing all this down for? So that we can argue about covenant theology or dispensationalism? No. But so that we can look at this and say, look, they're an example for us. Israel's an example. Hey, you know, son, daughter, don't do these things. You know, what they did good will do those things. What they did poorly, don't do those things. And it's exactly what Paul wrote down in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, teaching us what, that they're an example for us, what teaching to us to, to not obey ungodly lusts, to not be idolaters, to not do all those things. And so Israel being an example for us, seeing the remnant that, that God has perpetuated through them, I think it is so encouraging to me that, you know, God's relationship with Israel, how he demonstrates, and we'll see it very literally written down in this chapter, how he demonstrates that God is not a covenant breaker. Now, we're covenant breakers all day long, upside down, forwards and backwards. And I mean, if that's, a, that's why I have no hope in the idea that we have any works involved in salvation. Because if anything was dependent upon me for salvation, I promise you, I can guarantee you, I've only known myself for 42 years, but I know myself well enough by now to know that I, I won't hold up my end of the deal. I won't do it. That I, I relied on grace to come to Christ. I rely on grace today. <laughs> that, you know, not that I'm going out to in some kind of flamboyant, debaucherous, you know, licentious as a Christian lifestyle. But by grace, it's perpetuated and sustained. Grace is so important in Romans chapter 11. In fact, Paul even writes it down. By grace, God chose Israel to represent him. By grace, he has maintained, you know, a a remnant within them. And we got to move on. I'm sorry, verse 5. In the same way, then, there has also come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice. How? According to God's gracious, His gracious choice. There was no qualification in Israel. There was no qualification to begin with. There was no qualification developed along the way. Abraham didn't get very far into it before he lied. You know, and we see the weakness of Abraham. Not to put down Abraham, but to know that Abraham is like me. The hope, listen, if, if it doesn't bring you hope to look at the way God has loved Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all of Israel, you know, that, that's the only hope I know that he loves me. And that he'll hang on to me. And that his, you know, will for me has not passed and, and has not gone on, but... Just as he has persevered with Israel, he will persevere with me. Because just as they entered into a covenant with him, I've entered into a covenant with him. But by grace is what he said. Look at verse 6. But if it is grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. You know, that thing that, you know, <laughs> we're always trying to explain in a simple way to those who believe you have to earn your salvation or, or keep it with a certain number of works. I, I don't know of a verse in the Bible that puts it any better than this. I really don't. I mean, it's, it's so simple. It's uh, an elementary person, student could read it and understand it. But it, if it is by grace, listen, if it's by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, they're mutually, they're mutually what we call mutually exclusive. It's either or. Grace and works, by definition, cannot be both and it doesn't, you know, logically, by definition, they both won't work. And so he says, you know, it's by grace and not of works. Verse 7, what then? That which Israel is seeking for, it has not obtained. But those who were chosen obtained it, and the rest were hardened. Verse 8, just as it is written, God gave them a, a spirit of stupor eyes to see not and ears to hear not down to this very day and david says let their table become a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a retribution to them let their eyes be darkened to see not and bend their backs forever you know also a sobering thing in the example of israel for me is that god has always dealt with israel with chastisement and if we were to jump over to is it hebrews chapter 10 is that right Every son whom he receives, he scourgeth. 
I believe it's, is that sound right, maybe? Yes. Hebrews 12, okay, after the faith chapter. Yeah, that sounds right. Um, but we see that. We see how he interacted with Israel in chastisement. Also, how he will interact with us in chastisement. But there, there's a troubling thing here to answer. And I don't want to pass it up because I believe it was uh, the Lord that even mentioned this also in Matthew chapter 13 after he gave the parable of the soils and the people didn't understand. And he went back and he quoted whether it was Isaiah 29, 43, or 6 in Isaiah's calling. I, I don't know, but he made reference to that very thing. This is something God did to Israel, to unbelieving Israel. Remember in verse 7, it says that the, there were those who were, the, who were chosen, obtained it. Now, re remember what goes along with chosen, being chosen in God? It tells us in Romans chapter 8 that if you were chosen in God, you are also predestined in God. And if you were predestined in God, you're also foreknown by God. All those things go together. You can't, you know, you can't say, well, I was chosen, but I wasn't foreknown. Or I was foreknown and I wasn't chosen. No, every son, right, whom he received, every daughter, you know, that he foreknew, he predestined, he chose or he elected, he justified, he glorified in all those things. But for those who were foreknown, who were chosen, who were predestined, they obtained it. The rest were hardened. Why were they hardened? Because God's a mean God? No, because of their unbelief. God is very clear in Scripture what caused the hardening of the heart. It's unbelief. If you want to be more sure, go to Hebrews chapter 3. And he says very clearly that while it's today, respond to God. He said, lest you be deceived, lest you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin, is the way it puts it in Hebrews 3. That that's the way it describes it, that we're either softened or we're hardened. We're hardened by disbelief. But we go to this, and this is something God did to Israel. This was the message that God gave to Israel. He to see, but don't perceive, and hear, but don't understand. Make the heart of this people fat or dull is the way he put it in Isaiah chapter 6. There's other places. In fact, that wasn't new to Isaiah. Moses said that in Deuteronomy chapter 29. I don't have it marked, but I'll flip over to it. We'll do Bible drill. Let's see here. Deuteronomy chapter 29, verses 1 through 4. These are the words of the covenant uh, which the Lord commanded Moses to make uh, with the sons of Israel in the land of Moab, besides the covenant which he had made with them at Horeb. And Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, You have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes and in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and all his servants and all his land. Verse 3, Deuteronomy chapter 29. The great trials which your eyes have seen, and those great signs and wonders. Verse 4. Yet to this day the Lord has not given you a heart to know, nor eyes to see, nor ears to hear. That's where, you know, it's first mentioned. Isaiah, that was, that was Isaiah's calling and his message. How long, Lord, do I preach that, you know? And, and that's the very thing that we see today. And it's all for a reason. You know, it, it mentions it again in Isaiah chapter 29. Uh, and I believe <clears throat> the reason being uh, is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. It's explained to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. You know, why would God do that? You say, well, I thought God wanted all men to be saved. Yes, he does want all men to be saved. Why would he, you know, blind eyes? You know, why would he do that? Why would he cause ears to be dull of hearing? Why would he make it difficult for them to see? And th this is my perspective and the only sense I can make of it, that, I, that Israel had so much empirical evidence for God and the Lord Jesus Christ, that God had to do something special to ensure that the response to him was only by faith. I mean, imagine, think about that. 
that they had so much empirical, I mean, what I mean by empirical, tangible. You can see, you can hear, you know, you know, by its, the thickness in the tradition that you have. You know, we believe that George Washington was the first president of the United States. Why? Because we have some very strong history and tradition that shows us that. And Israel, you know, they had so much evidence. But listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, verse 21. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. In other words, in God's wise thinking, he made it so that in our worldly wisdom, we cannot come to know God. I think of, um, I can't think of his name, uh, the metaphysicist Richard Dawkins. You know, uh, that you want to talk about a man who is an absolute intellectual genius. It's just unbelievable the mental capacity that that man had that his secretary one time gave an account that she recited to him, she dictated to him 46 pages of notes for a mathematical problem. And of course he cannot write, you know, he, he, he's can't, not, he can't move anything except for an index finger, one small amount. Stephen Hawking, thank you. Yeah, Richard Dawkins is the other guy. Yeah, Stephen Hawking, so thank you. Um, but uh, that his, yeah, his secretary dictated to him 46 pages of mathematical notes. And he went through, and at some point in time, he got confused. So he backed up, telling her, you know, he backed up 20 pages, realizing he'd made a small error, and then went on and went forward and, and, you know, completed in his mind. And what little communication he had, you know, with her through his device. So I'm just saying that to, to get a grasp for this man's intellectual ability. Yet when they asked him to speak on the meaningfulness of life and whether or not man had a determined origin and purpose and design, his conclusion was this, and this is not an exact quote, but it's very close to what he said. He says, yes, it's clear that man has a design, but since we don't know that design or purpose, we might as well not be. That's the, that's the, you find the, the greatest amount of intelligence in this world to put towards something like that, and you come out with something so empty and disappointing. And, you know, you, where's the wise man, the question asks, that God through his wisdom, uh, that since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. How are we saved? Remember Romans chapter 10 last week? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You know, I know it's really great to be an apologist and to come up with all these arguments and all this stuff, but you'll never be able to argue somebody into heaven. You'll come a lot closer praying them into heaven, you know. You get a lot further on your knees, right, than, than with your finger, trying to convince them there's not enough worldly knowledge. Now, you think about who had knowledge of God. Nobody has historically has had more knowledge of God than Israel. Israel has had more knowledge of God, more experience with God. He's just been saturated in their culture from day one, in and out. There was so much empirical evidence for God in their culture that I believe he gave this very thing, you know, that see and don't perceive. Hear, but don't understand. And he made it to where they would have to come to God on a spiritual basis, heart first, in subjection to him, to see and to believe and to understand. That's just the way he made it. God can do that. You know, he, he's able to blind the eyes of men in order that they might be forced through another avenue. If you're looking for proof of God, stop looking for proof because he said it's by faith. That, you know, that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. And so we, we look at that and we try to find a reason why. You know, God gave them a spirit of stupor and he gave them eyes to see. Here's another one, if you like flipping around. Second Corinthians uh, 3, if I can get there. Look at Second Corinthians chapter 3.
Paul talking about the ministry that they have, a uh, ministry of righteousness to abounding glory, and he moves on. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, look at verse um, 12. He says, Having therefore such a hope, we use great boldness in our speech, verse 13, and are not as Moses, who used to put a veil over his face, that the sons of Israel might not look intently at the end of what was fading away. Verse 14, But their minds were hardened, for until this very day, at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted, because it is removed in Christ. There's something there. It's like, uh, I, I think of a parent, you know, and when the parent wants that child to eat, your vegetables. <laughs> Eat your vegetables. And the child says, no, I want a cookie. You know, and the parent takes that cookie and hides it so that that child cannot reach it, find it, know where it is, nothing. And the only thing that is set before that child is that green bean that they have to eat. And that child does not have the capacity. That child has been limited in capacity by the parent to search out, to seek, to find, to obtain that cookie on their own. They can't do it. That little 18-month-old cannot do it. But what that 18-month-old is presented with is, you eat your green bean, I'll show you the cookie. You eat your green bean, and I'll show you the cookie. And the, the green bean has become a stumbling block for the child, and he'll never get to know the presence, the goodness, the texture, the taste, the chocolate chips, the toffee nuts, the pecans, all whatever richness is in that cookie. He'll never know it until he comes to subjection to that green bean. They've stumbled over green bean of Christ. He was a stumbling block. God says, you know, you come through me in subjection to me and to my son. And they want to go on to conquest and glory and, and preference in God. And, you know, we want to be the people, not until you eat your green bean. <laughs> not until you eat the green bean of Christ. And he's, he's placed that there before them. It says that veil is there that they cannot perceive with their minds, they cannot understand with their physical senten, you know, senses, that they have to come to God spiritually and on a spiritual basis subject themselves to Him. And then that veil is removed in Christ. And the veil really was removed in Christ. If you remember when He died, that that veil whoosh, you know, was torn in two. And what does that mean for a Jew? That the way into the presence of God and fellowship and personal intimacy with God was made possible in that very thing. So why did God give them a spirit of stupor? In order that they might believe on him by faith, spiritually, that God in, you know, spiritually might bear witness with their spirit, and that they might have that conviction, just as the same way that we have to come to God. Uh, but they had so much evidence given unto them and verse 10, I'm sorry, he says, Let their eyes be darkened to, not, to see not, and bend their backs forever. You know, what David is talking about is they're like, <laughs> when they're trying to look at something and understand it, and they're bending down their backs forever to see that. And in verse 11, it says, I say then, they did not stumble so as to fall, did they? May it never be. But by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles, to make them jealous. Now this is something that God was telling them for a long time, just like in Hosea, in Isaiah, and Hosea both, and perhaps elsewhere that I can't think of, that God was telling them over and over, listen, you think you're something special. You know, you think you're unique. What did Jesus tell the Pharisees that if all those people were to, if he were to make them to be quiet, that even the stones... Right? Even the stones. And this is a sober warning for me. I think about this. Because God called, it's very clear that God called Israel to represent him before the nations. When they showed as a nation collectively that they were not willing to do that, well, guess what? God took a, a small remnant, a small group of people, and he went on and he planted those seeds, and they went like wildfire throughout the Gentile world. Now today, Christendom is probably over 95% Gentile. You know, it's way, way, way up there. And so many people who did not necessarily go out seeking God have now, 
And, and I think it's so hard for us to understand since we're not Israel. I actually thought about it in terms of, of a wife and another wife. And we see examples of multiple wives like Jacob and Leah and Rachel and the, and the, the drama that went on there. But I think of a man who had a wife who did not honor him, who did not respect him, who did not obey him and listen to him and, and fulfill all those roles. And God said, okay, I, I'll get another bride. Hold on, honey. Hold on right there. And he went and he brought unto himself another bride. You know, the Gentile church. And then that Jewish bride became jealous because of the intimacy and the relationship that, that God had with the Gentile church in, in that sense. Now, am I saying that God supports polygamy? No. I'm just trying to put it in our, you know, fleshly terms so that we can get an idea what it's like for Israel and how they could be provoked into jealousy, you know, because they love the idea of being God's people. They love the idea of being, you know, the chosen and select and set apart and a peculiar people and having the truth of God and having victory in God and all those things. Yet they did not want to honor God himself in it as a nation, as a whole. And so what he provoked them to jealousy through another people. And verse 12, he says, Now if their transgression be riches for the world and their failure be riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? In other words, listen, if, if the result of Israel's disobedience was the gospel coming to us and, and revival happening among the Gentiles and millions and millions you know, over the last 2,000 years believing, if that came out of the transgression of Israel, what would come out of their obedience? Now, I believe Paul is painting a picture towards what's going to be someday because he makes mention of it when all Israel as a nation will be saved. You know, I don't mean every Jew that ever existed, but I mean just them as a collective whole at another time in the future will serve him and worship him as an ethnic group together. They will serve the Lord, and it's going to be remarkable. So Paul's saying, listen, in, in our time that we live in, this church age that we live in, and 2,000 years ago, we saw the culmination of Israel's rejection of God in the person of Christ when he was crucified. You know, And I don't mean every Jew, like I'm saying. I mean them as a whole, as a nation. You know What they did, what do you think it's going to be like in the time of tribulation? when he collects them all together, when he purifies them, when they're going to be this people as a whole. Listen, if their transgression and their failure were riches to the Gentiles, how much more would their fulfillment be? Like, it's going to be wow. You know, you thought Billy Graham revivals were something. You, got, you have no idea. You know, you have no idea what it's like. He says in verse 13, but, but I'm speaking to you who are Gentiles inasmuch then... As I am an apostle to the, of Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. Paul made it very clear. I think it was also in, I don't know, either First or Second Timothy chapter 3. It's, it's thought that Paul actually saw himself as a type or a first fruit of those 144,000 Jews to the Gentiles. Because Paul was a Jew of the Jew, a Benjamite, you know, circumcised the eighth day, and his ministry was unto the Gentiles. It's one little verse there. I think it's uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. If not 1 Timothy chapter 3, but something interesting to listen to. But verse 14, if somehow I might move to jealousy my fellow countrymen and save some of them. Now, Paul literally did this in Acts. He would go and he would go to the synagogue and for three Sabbaths, you know, there was a Saturday, there was the week, there was a Saturday, there was the week, there was a third Saturday, and he would go to the synagogue and he would preach Jesus. And literally, verbally, he said at times, oh, no, okay, since you count yourselves unworthy of this wonderful gift, I'm going to the Gentiles. <laughs> and then the fireworks started, right? And he did. He provoked them to jealousy in, in that sense. In verse 15, For if their rejection be the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from dead? In other words, Paul's saying, listen, what, what did God choose Israel to do? He chose them to be uh, 
a light to the world. That they were supposed to be that bright light. And, and, they're, and he's saying, listen, if they would only come around to fulfill that will of God for their life, boy, would they ever shine like a diamond. You know, even in their flop and their failure. And, and honestly, you know, I, I think of times of myself as a Christian, as a pastor, when my life was not what it should have been in the Lord and how humiliating and embarrassing it was for me in times of rebellion for God to use me to lead somebody to Christ. And I stop and think, man, if God will lose, use me in my foolishness time, foolish times to lead somebody to Christ, what would God do with me if I, if I really gave my whole heart to serve him? I mean, in, in, in his abundant graciousness, overriding foolishness in my life, you know, if, if Israel, even through their foolishness, God still brought about wonderful things, what will it be in that time when as a nation they turn to him and they serve him? Oh, it would be something spectacular. It would be something wonderful is the way Paul is putting it, that if in their rejection... For if the rejection be the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance but be but life from the dead? Verse 16, he says, but if, the, but if the first piece of the dough be holy, the lump is also. And if the root be holy, the branches are too. But if some of the branches be broken off, and you, being a wild olive, were grafted in among them and became partaker with them, of the rich root of the olive tree. Now listen, we are all, whether you like to acknowledge it or not, and uh, I had a hard time with the anti-semantics uh, of you know a lot of the what we call modern age theologians, which was really back to 16. The, the modern era is like 16th, 17th, 18th century. Uh, actually, 18th was getting into postmodern, but I don't know why they call it the modern era. It's a theology thing. Uh, it doesn't make sense. A lot of theology doesn't make sense. So just warning you <laughs> ahead of time. But there was this thinking of anti-Semitism. Uh, but really, listen, we ought to be quite grateful to the Jewish nation because it was through him that God has done all these things, that through them that God brought this Savior about. And I say all these things to, to, just to point out the practical thing. Listen, don't ever find yourself bad-mouthing those through whom God has brought the gospel to you. Especially when you study church history, even when you think about your grandparents, I, I think it's a commonality and it's definitely evident today that even my generation and below, we probably esteem ourselves wiser and more moral and just altogether better than our grandparents. We wouldn't say that because we're good, respectful people. But by our own mentalities, I even hear people, oh, you know, my grandparents, <laughs> they think this, they did this, or, you know, maybe they didn't have your technology, but listen, don't think that your grandparents weren't every bit as good, moral, God-fearing, you know, the, just as good a people, for, maybe they were better than we are, you know? Maybe they were better, their sin looked different, but perhaps they were better than they are. And I say this because I've seen this in the church, and it's really grievous, and, and, I, and I suppose I have to leave off here soon. But um, I remember some years ago, maybe it was 10 years ago. It was in 2008, 11 years ago. A denomination, I don't need to say the denomination, but a denomination got some funds together, and they collected some support, and they gave it to a group of individuals to plant a church. And they planted a church in a city not far from here. This is a true story, real story. And they did not label this new church plant with the denominational name because they did not want to give, you know, potential goers, you know, and I understand, they didn't want, they didn't want to label it with that denominational name so that the potential goers might not be discouraged from what they heard or experienced at some other time. And I watched this young church plant just take off and grow and expand and develop and just flourish, and they bought one building and they filled it up, and they bought another building and they filled it up, and then they had to buy a third building. 
And, and today they're running two services. I think collectively they're running over 12, 1,300 people every Sunday. But I'll tell you what just grieves me the most. About two or three years ago, that pastor of that church started ridiculing uh, the, a lot of the traditional thought and, and positions held. Not by some other group, but by the very denomination that planted them. And it was just, it was just uh, first of all, to hear a Christian badmouth a Christian was just horrible enough to ridicule them. But he just, you know, he went on and he posted on Facebook and and it, t- it took everything I had in me not to call him up, you know. <laughs> and I was like, God, if you want me to talk to him, you're just going to have to really. But I mean, but that's ultimately what he did. He started making fun of them because, hey, he had his 1,200 people going every. And what an ungodly, despicable, horrible thing to do and to show the world all around us. Listen, don't catch yourself bad mouthing those who have made the way for you in Christian service. I don't care what you think about them. You, they need some kind of respect, some kind of reverence. You know, did you agree with John Calvin? Well, maybe you did, maybe you didn't. But the man was clearly a Christian man who, who deserves some respect. We need to respect the church. Listen, you forget that the church is God's beloved. It's the apple of his eye. It's the thing that he loves. And we get to the point where theologically, oh, those bozos over there and these guys over here. And, and, and you, you forget that, listen, people cried tears to God for you to come to Christ. And, you know, very likely, you know, men and women forfeited their secular cares and put their life into ministry in order for us to come to know Christ. And let's be careful about how we go back and speak of those before us in Christ, that is those who've carried the message. Even in, in terms of Israel, the Jewish nation, is it evident that they rejected God? Yes, it is. Uh, do we need to find ourselves bad-mouthing them? No, we really don't. Um, but this is what he said. Listen, you're grafted in. Verse 18, he says, Do not be arrogant towards the branches. Don't be arrogant. You know, don't... No, oh, those, those goofy Jews, a bunch of idiots, you know. How could they do that? Listen, they're just like you and me by faith. They have the same you know, requirement, they have to come to God through faith in Jesus Christ. God already said, listen, all their empirical evidence and tradition, that he's limited that, he's put a veil over their eyes, so that when the, when the word is read, you know that. Uh, and whoever it may be, maybe it's your Methodist and Baptist and Church of Christ uh, grandparents, you know, all oh, those old fogies, bunch of goofballs no you better give them some don't be arrogant against those who have gone before you in christ you know don't find yourself in that place of arrogance listen by god's grace we're grafted in is what he said verse 18 do not be arrogant towards the branches but if you are arrogant remember that it is not you who supports the root but the root supports you right you know was David a goofball? Well, guess what? The, the message of Christ trickled down through David, and God actually used his lineage to bring about Christ incarnate. You know, so be careful when you read David, you know, about David and want to criticize him. Be careful when you, when you read about Elijah and want to think that Elijah was some quitting, you know, wimp that went out in the desert. Be careful when you read about Moses and when you read about Sarah laughing and assuming that you won't do these things. I mean, we need to maintain a spirit of respect towards these things and to know what they went through. I think anybody who has that spirit of arrogance has never really determined in the most private aspects of their life to serve the Lord because when you do that, you realize how helpless and depraved you are and how dependent you are on grace and you don't have anything to boast of. In fact, you get to the point where you esteem everybody better than yourself because you know, you know more about yourself and you're like, well, I don't know. I see what they appear to be, but I'm, if I had to guess, they're probably a better Christian than I am. I don't know. I know too many details about myself. You know, that's the problem. Verse 19, he says, You will say then the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. 
Quite right. They were broken off for their... Why were they broken off? They were broken off for their unbelief. That's the thing I went back to, 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 to mention that very thing in, in regards to, you know, that God has rejected, you know, has he rejected his people whom he foreknew? But no, but those, you know, in verse 5, he says, In the same way, there has also come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice. And verse 7, he says that that which Israel is seeking for it has not obtained, but those who were chosen obtained it, and the rest were hardened. And, and we get into this. Now, here's the warning about some of the doctrinal things in here. Some people come to the conclusion in Romans chapter 9 and Romans chapter 11 that there is no free will with man. There is no decision to be made in our hearts that God will choose who's going to be saved and God's choosing who's going to not be saved. And there's nothing there. But the th thing he said here, he didn't say that they were broken off because they were not the elect. He said they were broken off because of their unbelief. But you stand by your faith. There's the, the contrary part. They were broken off because of their unbelief. Why were you grafted in? Because of your faith and nothing else. Because of your faith in God. He said, do not be conceited, but fear. Verse 21, for if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you and this is what i mean in terms of god talking in in collective terms you know that uh you know does that mean that you know you know you know bob jones who believes on christ and is grafted in next week and then decides he doesn't want to believe is loses his salvation is ungrafted no that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about people, groups, and cultures. He's talking about Jews and Gentiles. Jews, for some who did not believe, well, their were, branches were broken off because of unbelief. You know, bodies, groups of people, generalities. Gentiles being grafted in, not on an individual basis. He's talking about it, a people group. But listen, the warning is, is that whatever people group it is, if you reject Christ, well, there is no grafting in. You know, there is no part in this tree in this root <clears throat> and so i say you know I, I i don't we don't have the time to finish all this but what is there to say about this that we have read you know the the greatest tragedy to read here is that for millions and millions and millions of jews something was provided there an opportunity was made and it was not taken you know there are examples unto us and my, my greatest emphasis is that which is the Scriptures and that which we see in the beginning of Romans chapter 12. Listen, if you know the opportunity and the potential and the provision that's made in Christ, don't be like those who refuse to believe. Don't be as those who passed up the opportunity. You know, don't be as, be as, as the one who would choose Christ, trust Him, believe on Him, and have a place in Him. You know, and not only that, but a place in him that that cannot perish, that nothing can take away, that you can't lose. You know, I, you know, we, we can become fearful based on the things we can lose. And the more you love the things that you have that you can lose, the greater, greater power there is. You know, what if somebody takes away your money? Oh, no. You know, we see fear. We've seen fear in the last three weeks. The stock market crash. I lost my retirement. There's a, a, a deadly illness going around. I might die. You know, my business is horrible. I might lose my business. And, and we're, you know, and fear just drives our lives one way or the other. Listen, if you know what you have in Christ and that can't be taken away, <laughs> you always have a reason for hope. And God has demonstrated the, the greatest picture of it all that even in Israel, and he chose a rebellious example, just in case you're a rebellious person like me, he chose a rebellious example. If he had chosen a really good example, I might be afraid and say, well, I don't know. They were really good people. I'm not really good people. You know, but he chose that rebellious example to show the, the magnitude of his grace and his mercy and the full intent of his covenant with them that he will see through. What hope which should we have? You know, do, Have you lost all confidence in yourself? Me too. But not in God, you know, not in God. He maintains covenants. He perseveres. He loves, if he loves Israel to this day, I know he loves me. 
until this day. And that's a great hope. That's a great hope. So there you go. Now may God bless you. Uh, may he make his face to shine on you, lift up his countenance unto you. May God bless us to realize the treasure that is in Christ and the opportunity that we have in him that we might act on it, that we might live soberly, right? Live our lives soberly and to choose him. So God bless you until I see you again, maybe two more weeks. We'll see what happens. So, Bye.